Nevada received $6.7 billion in federal funds from the American Rescue Plan Act. So where has the money gone and how much has yet to be spent? That's this week on Nevada Week. Support for Nevada Week is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt and additional supporting sponsors. Welcome to Nevada Week. I'm Amber Renee Dixon. In March of 2021, Congress passed a massive coronavirus relief package known as the American Rescue Plan Act. It doled out $350 billion to states, local governments and school districts. Of the $6.7 billion Nevada got, some of it was already earmarked for specific purposes. The state itself ended up with $2.7 billion for its general fund, while local counties and cities received more than $1 billion. At his State of the State address in February, Nevada Democratic Governor Steve Sisolak designated 500 million American Rescue Plan Act dollars to the Home Means Nevada initiative. The initiative launched in April and aims to address the lack of affordable housing in Nevada with 300 million for the development of multifamily units, 130 million to preserve existing affordable housing units, 40 million to acquire land on which to construct affordable housing, and 30 million to increase home ownership. And joining us now to talk about the need for this initiative, concerns surrounding how effective it will be, and other uses of state ARPA funds thus far, is Nevada Current reporter Michael Lyle. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. A recent article of yours painted a dire picture for what the average worker in Nevada is able to afford for housing. What did you learn through that reporting? Thank you so much for having me. So UNLV released a study over the summer that looked at workers in Nevada and they found in Southern Nevada, seven out of 10 of the top occupations and in Northern Nevada, six out of 10 of the top occupations could not afford uh, to, er, to afford the housing that they they uh, needed to, li to live and to survive. So they could not afford on their own, on their own incomes, even a studio bedroom. I think only two out of the top occupations here in Southern Nevada could actually afford the rent for a rising cost of a studio apartment. That is shocking. It is shocking and dire. Just paints a picture of just the things and the occupations making our state and economy run. The workers that are filling those jobs can't afford to live. Many of them are in retail, as your article noted. Yes. Uh, the $500 million Home Means Nevada initiative. When we had State Treasurer Zach Conine on last month to talk about this, he said that that $500 million could result in about 2,500 affordable multifamily housing units being built. I want to hear your thoughts on that, but first let's listen to his soundbite. 2,500 doesn't seem like enough. It's not it's not nearly enough. Not we nearly know the enough. hole in housing in the in the state of Nevada is about 105,000 uh, units, right? That's the hole of an affordable housing. The 80% um, of that give or take is affordable housing, right? So it's 105 total and then a little bit more than 80 that's affordable. Every bit helps, right? Every house matters an exceptional amount for the family that can be in there and we keep looking for ways that we can expand it. Your thoughts on that number, 2,500. Yeah, it is a drop in the bucket. So we went into the pandemic in a housing crisis where there was about 100,000 deficit in affordable housing units. What that means is people are paying more than 30% of their income. Or, or, to be considered housing secure, you're paying less than 30% of your income towards housing and utilities. This means that people are paying way more, probably up into 50% of their income towards housing needs, meaning it's draining other parts of what they need, whether it's food, whether it's prescriptions. So it's cutting into that. Uh, so this money is unprecedented and amazing, but it's only gonna, it's only a drop in the bucket to what the need is. And of that 100,000 units that we lack, the most severe is for people making less than 30% of area median income or those that are homeless that are com coming off the streets and have no income. 
The Interim Finance Committee is in charge of approving who gets these uh, ARPA dollars. It is made up of state legislatures and legislators, and in April, they voted to approve $250 million, the first half of that $500 million, to go to the Nevada Housing Division to begin work. But some of them were hesitant to give the yes. What was behind their hesitation? It's all about oversight. I mean, you have a, a, a government committee out of the governor's office, so the housing division has a seven-person committee, and they're going to be reviewing these funds to where what projects they're going to be financing. And so a part of it was concerns from both Democrats and Republicans about the oversight of how these projects are going to be picked and how these dollars are going to be allocated. Uh, but one of the senators that voted in, in favor of it, who was raising these concerns, also mentioned, well, that's what we're here for, to provide some uh, government oversight to you. And so it was even though three Republicans voted against it, it was did receive bipartisan support. But the biggest concern was a lot of the oversight behind this. Uh, saying, how are we going to make sure that this actually works out? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, what has the Nevada Housing Division been able to accomplish since April? Yeah, so they had a pre-application process that they were seeking applications for four categories, the for, uh, development of multifamily housing, of land acquisition dollars, of home ownership, and for housing preservation. And so they did a pre-application process and looked at about 234 applications. And of that, they whittled it down to 180 applications within four of those uh, categories. And so they're still reviewing the process and they expect it to uh, have their final review by the end of August and start disseminating some of these funds in September. And that would be for developers to actually begin these projects. Yeah, to hit the ground running, but it's gonna take some time before we actually see any of these uh, projects uh, be built and come off the ground and units available for people to live in. To actually occupy, how long till we might see these homes? It might take a year or two, to be honest. Um, it, I mean, housing development is a very complicated process in general, and so, but we have seen, uh, just because of the pandemic and what coming out of the pandemic, I mean, we're still in a pandemic, but just because of the nuances of the pandemic, it's just, it's taking some time to, to see these projects uh, come off the ground. And so it's going to it's going to take a little bit of time. <laughs> Did any of the state lawmakers talk about that? I mean, lack of uh, construction supplies, how long it's taking because of supply chain issues and, and price of construction materials. So that actually has not come up right now. I have not heard anything of that come up in the interim finance committee. But I'm sure that's going to come up as they start approving these projects to get a realistic expectation and overview of once they identify the project of when we're going to see uh, them, them actually start being constructed. Okay, talking about the timeline, bear with me here for these ARPA funds. October 2021 was when the state began accepting grant proposals uh, for these funds. $2.7 billion is what the state got. $30 million was set aside as part of the Community Recovery Grant Program, and that was to benefit nonprofits. On Tuesday, the rest of that money was doled out, so it is all now accounted for. Uh, but from October until Tuesday, that's about nine months, and there were nonprofits saying, what is taking so long? Had you heard any of that, and how were lawmakers responding? I have not heard from nonprofits why it's taking so long, but I will say the state did see a sizable portion of applications. I mean, the need is great. The need for nonprofits, whether it's housing services, whether it's food services, whether it's childcare, the need has been so overwhelming even before the pandemic and just exacerbated by the pandemic. And so they received a lot of applications. So I can see why it took some time to sort through everything before we actually saw any action. And when I, I can imagine how frustrating it is for nonprofits to have to wait, um, but it is a process. Yeah, uh, as you have reported, the state has designated in the past six months 50 million for the Nevada Child Care Fund, 75 million for universal free school meals in public schools, and 500 million to invest in broadband infrastructure. Now with the 30 million accounted for with that community program for the nonprofits, uh, the state says there is about $1.1 billion left of that $2.7 billion. It was the governor who asked for that $30 million to be set aside. Uh, of course, it was up to the Interim Finance Committee to okay that. How much pull does the governor have in these decisions of how ARPA funds are being spent? I'm sure there is some 
coordination between the governor's office and the legislative committees about the ARPA dollars, um, which is going to play an interesting question going into the 2022 election uh, because there's still going to be some there's things that the governor is going to need to do, and so it could vary drastically depending if uh, Governor Sisolak is reelected or Sheriff Joe Lombardo, the Republican uh, incum Republican sheriff that's challenging him, gets uh, in elected into the office to see what direction they're going to take the state and use these funds and what what his priorities for this f funds are. Do you think what do you think the governor wants his constituents, Nevadans, to think about how much power he has in? determining the use of these funds. I th He's been at the front of a lot of press conferences lately touting how the dollars are being spent. I think he wants people to know that this is an unprecedented amount of money and he's taking it very seriously of how we can fix systemic problems using this money. Um, since the launch, even before October, they had a launch event last summer, kind of having an exploration committee and doing like an 80 day statewide tour with the treasurer uh, to solicit application. So I think he wants the people to know that, hey, we're taking this money that it's unprecedented and we're trying to fix some of these systemic gaps that we have long seen. I think he's trying to get out in front to be like, hey, I'm actually working and trying hard to fix the lives of and uh, fix the issues most dear to the people of Nevada. The state has until the end of 2024 to allocate these funds. So with the election in November of this year, are voters going to be able to tell how well his decisions or his influence in where this money is going, how well it ended up turning out? That is a good question, and I'm going to be a journalist. It's going to be uncomfortable to say I don't know. Um, I think more journalists should be okay with saying that. Oh, because, I totally am. Because there, it's, there's so many different issues at play in this November election on the national and local scene between inflation, the response to climate change, uh, reproductive rights of women, uh, uh, human rights of LGBTQ community. There's so much at play, let alone just the, the everyday issues of housing is increasing, rent is increasing, cost of foods and services. And so I think the governor's, governor's response will play a role in how voters turn out and who they vote for, especially, and also to what priorities uh, Lombardo puts forward. I think those will play, put, become in play, but I don't know how much that's gonna factor in way into the final decision, how people vote. And the Republican response to how the governor is using these funds? What's what it response? Been? <laughs> uh, I know that reporters, including Nevada Current, have asked pri policy priorities for uh, uh, Sheriff Lombardo and how he would respond differently for using these federal dollars. And he hasn't actually responded to how he, he has criticized about oversight, which is, of course, a, 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 a topic we do need to cover about oversight, but he hasn't put forward any pri uh, policy priorities of how he would actually spend these dollars. Michael Lyle with the Nevada Current. We look forward to having you on Nevada Week in person on September 3rd. Thank you so much. With urging from Governor Sisolak, state lawmakers recently approved $50 million of ARPA funding for the Nevada Child Care Fund, which we mentioned. Sisolak says lack of access to affordable and reliable child care is what's keeping several parents who left the workforce during the pandemic from returning. Before touring a College of Southern Nevada on-site daycare, Nevada Governor Steve Sisolak unveiled details of the Nevada Child Care Fund. A robust child care system is critical to Nevada's economy and to our state's recovery. The fund promises to increase the assistance that he says more than 5,000 Nevada families are already receiving. The average amount we're giving families per child is about $551 per month per child. With the new funding for the Nevada Child Care Program, we will be able to cover more costs for more families and help more families get their children into quality child care without breaking the bank. Sisolak says eligibility expanded as well. According to Carissa Loper Machado, agency manager of the state's child care and development program, a family of four making about sixty to seventy thousand dollars per year now qualifies for child care assistance. We've essentially doubled the amount of money a family could make annually and still be eligible for child care assistance. She and Sisolak say they strongly encourage previously denied applicants to reapply. 
Loper Machado said she expects ARPA money to fund this child care program through 2023. What happens once ARPA funds are exhausted is a concern for some nonprofits using those federal dollars to start new programs. Here now to discuss that and how they've used their ARPA dollars to improve the lives of Southern Nevadans are Nina Gallagher, Development Director for Helping Hands of Vegas Valley, and Karen Martin, Chairman of Operation School Bell for the Assistance League of Las Vegas. Ladies, thank you both for joining us. I'll start off with what does your organization do and what are you using these ARPA dollars for? So Helping Hands of Vegas Valley is a nonprofit whose mission is to impact the lives of our senior citizens in the local community um, through a number of programs and services that we offer for free. Um, in regards to the ARPA funds, it's being utilized for our rural uh, pantry program. So with that said, it's we're supporting both seniors in Clark County, in Moapa, in Tonopah, in Beatty, in Pahrump, Mesquite of all places, but the need is evident. It's, it, it's, it exists. So. That's where that funding is going. Something about a kitchen renovation as well? So that, um, we're partnering up with a with an organization who is going to build a, a, a kitchen who will eventually become a space for congregate meals for our seniors. Because socializa socialization is important, right? And just since the last few years of being closed up and kind of kept from the, the common folk, not the common folk, but the general public, right. um, we're just trying to reintroduce them into being with others and doing some activities. But um, yeah, that's part of that as well. But wow, our rural program, each of our clients will receive 20 to 30 um, prepared meals. So they're shelf stable or frozen. And um, it's direct ship to each of their homes because they truly live in a, in a food desert. So no quick access to food, so. What about Operation School Bell? Operation School Bell is a program of the Assistance League of Las Vegas, and we impact the lives of children, and we also have some programs that help adults. But Operation School Bell is mostly, it, well, is completely geared toward uh, helping children get dressed for school so that they've got, uh, they've got what they need to feel confident. So we provide a full week's worth of clothing uh, including uh, school supplies, a jacket, shoes, socks, you know, close to where to school uniforms if that's necessary. And we provide that to any child in need in the Clark County School District. You had told me off camera that it's important for parents interested in using your program to reach out directly to the school. That's right. Uh, there is so much need. We uh, are sensitive to the fact that we've received so many emails and phone calls regarding uh, parents that need help uh, dressing their children, getting them ready to go back to school. And as empathetic as we are, uh, they've got to go through the schools. We need to be accountable for all of the children that we serve, and we do that you know, through uh, going through the schools and uh, tracking, tracking the students. Accountability is a big part of getting these ARPA dollars. There are reporting requirements you have to show this is how we are spending the money, and that's before you submit to get reimbursed. You're not getting this money right up front. You have to begin implementing your program and, and then get reimbursed. Um, the governor has called these funds a once in a lifetime kind of opportunity. How impactful are these funds for you and your organization? For our organization, it's huge because we provide services that actually help to create some independence and for these seniors to live with some dignity and for as long as they can within their own dwelling without having to be taken someplace else. Um, Sorry, <laughs> um, but these funds, we have a case management team that are wonderful who do assessments with those in need. And so with that, there are parameters and stipulations because of the funding that they have to meet certain requirements. And a, I'd say 100% of our clients are at 185% of the current federal po poverty level, which is our average senior makes below $800 a month. And so when that rent increase happened, they're, they're stuck with the decision of whether they pay for the roof over their head, food in their tummy, or I get so emotional, sorry, <laughs> um, or medication. So um, through Helping Hands of Vegas Valley, we're offering 
pantry and a number of, of services underneath pantry, transportation to medical appointments, to the pharmacy, to the grocery store. Um, we deliver groceries every first and third Saturday. And these people are so grateful for everything and anything they receive. And um, we have a respite care program, which is awesome. We're trying to make respite care sexy, if you will, <laughs> for our caregivers to one, care for themselves first with the realization that they could be better caretakers for their loved ones. And so um, that's a huge uh, effort that we make. And then minor home repair. So those of our seniors who live at home and can prove that they're, they own their place, we um, get in there and especially during the summer months, like right now it being super hot, tons of requests for air conditioning units to be replaced. That's anywhere from seven to $10,000. Mm. And we have wonderful partners who give us discounted rates to make that happen because nothing ever comes out of the pocket of a, a senior. All services and programs are completely free. And today to speak to supporting children in the Valley, our grandparents, we have 588 grandchildren under the care of some of our clients. Mm. And so today we did a back to school event this morning to get them started with the necessary supplies to get the, the year going. So I would love to, to partner with you in, in regards to making that effort even more successful. So. Oh, wonderful. That would be great, yes. Thank Operation you so much. Operation School Bell, how many children are you gonna be able to serve with this money? We, uh, with the money that we are getting, we'll be able to serve 900 children. Uh, we are used to doing 8,000 in a year, but because of the pandemic, uh, our, our numbers have been down, schools were closed for a while, and we had volunteers filling bags and driving them around the valley to drop off at different schools. But yes, this will be wonderful to serve 900 uh, additional children. Our funding sources are down as a result of the pandemic and uh, we are fortunate to have a grant writing team that looks for every opportunity to get funds because uh, the, and the more we have, the more children we can serve. What was your strategy with your proposals? Because this is a one-time use of funds. It's going to run out. So there are some nonprofits that started new programs and they will face that reality. You chose to stick with Operation School Bell. We did, we chose to stick with that and to just provide uh, services to an additional number of students. And when that runny, money runs out? You know, we are fortunate that um, we have a thrift store, a wonderful thrift store that brings in income for us and other private and corporate donors. But every, every uh, penny makes a, a difference into how we are able to operate. And what about you with what you are doing with the money? How much of it is new? Um, and how much of it is what you are already doing? So we started this program at the height of pandemic. Um, and so that brought some light to the true need in the Valley and beyond, right, Clark County. And so um, because of the fact that we kept getting more, um, when I go back to the silver lining, bringing more awareness to what we do, it literally, it's word of mouth really that we have our seniors tell another senior and another senior shares it and they are literally helping each other, seniors serving seniors, which is wonderful. And um, so with this program, we, with the funding, it'll help to improve and allow us to continue the support. But even once those funds are depleted, we have, I say relationships are so important. And because of the relationships that we've built in the Valley, that'll help us sustain that very program. I wanna read to you uh, a statement I got from Stacy Wedding. She is local and she is a consultant for nonprofits. I asked her about how her clients are using ARPA funds. She said, quote, a majority of my nonprofit clients have all taken advantage of ARPA funding. It's a mixed bag. Many are grateful to have the support, but wonder A, when a funding decision will be made and when they will be notified, B, how quickly they will need to spend the money given the delays in decisions, and C, how they will sustain after ARPA funds are exhausted. Now, this was before Tuesday because on Tuesday, the Interim Finance Committee uh, allocated the rest of the money to the nonprofit. So nonprofits who applied uh, now know whether they're getting funding or not. But do any of those issues uh, apply to you? We did discuss the ARPA funds running out at some point, but anything else there? Um, I think really with any nonprofit, um, it's, there's always gonna be challenges. And the funding, regardless of where the funding is coming from, it's being able to have that smart team in place who knows 
okay, this is where we're allocating dollars, these are our priorities, but we're gonna continue regardless of the challenges to serve and continue to, because our mission exists, because a problem exists, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're here to solve them and we appreciate the funding that we will receive and do you know when you will receive it? When are you able to begin getting it reimbursed? We don't know as of yet. So that is an issue. Yes, uh, which is okay because, I mean, I wanted to find the good in all things, but with our team at Helping Hands of Vegas Valley, it's we continue to just push through. We manage, balance all things, and so once we do get a reimbursement, that's a celebration, right? Because now we can continue to do other things. And one last point I want to make is that the state has, by the end of 2024, to allocate all the money. Then the onus is on the nonprofits to spend all of that by 2026. That is not an issue for you, though, because your program is just for one year, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. And we spoke about the issue of reserves, how important they are for these nonprofits, because you're not going to get reimbursed until... That's right. Uh, we have a board of directors, and we've been very conservative with our funds. So we have a minimum of a year's reserve operating funds. And uh, again, we have a grant team that uh, takes advantage of other opportunities for funding. So we will spend it. That will not be an issue for <laughs> us. And we will continue to uh, look to other opportunities You'll for find, fundraising, correct. You will find a way. We Ladies, will definitely. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us today. We do want to acknowledge that like many community-based organizations, Vegas PBS has requested ARPA funding. For any of the resources discussed on the show, including links to affordable housing and childcare information, as well as links to the two nonprofits we featured, go to our website, vegaspbs.org slash Nevada Week. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Vegas PBS.